So in, in, in discussing the right heart, we're we are going to look at um, the right ventricular size and function. Uh, of course, we have to know how to identify that what we're talking about is the right ventricle. And we'll go over that. We're going to look at the right atrial size and function, uh, the tricuspid valve, pulmonic valve, inferior vena cava. So we're going to look at all the structures um, on the right side of the heart. Uh, say we, we, we had neglect because it's a low pressure uh, structure you know the, the the right atrium and the right ventricle and even the the, the pulmonary circuit to some extent it is a low pressure uh, uh, system so we we had neglect them but we have paid the price for that and now we have um, come to to appreciate a little bit better so when we look at the the right ventricle Again, it's very important to identify uh, the right ventricle. And of course, when, when someone comes to the echo lab, the heart is not labeled. And what, what you see on the right side might not be the right ventricle. So you have to know how to identify the right ventricle. Remember, the right ventricle is identified by the, the lowermost uh, AV valve. Okay, so the, the AV valve that is lowermost in 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 the, the, the what looks like the ventricular chamber identify the, the 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 right ventricle. Again, the right ventricle tend to be more trabeculated than the left ventricle, and you will have more than two. You have multiple papillary muscles, three uh, usually. And of course, you're going to have the moderator band. So these are all the things that will help you to identify the right ventricle. Uh, so, uh, and so again, re remember that the, the right ventricle receives uh, blood from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve. Uh, the disease that affects the, the right ventricle include right ventricular infarct. And when we say right ventricular infarct, if there's an obstruction to the 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 the, um, the blood vessel supply in the right ventricle, usually the right coronary artery. So if you have obstruction to the right coronary artery and the heart muscle dies, you get a right ventricular infarct. And this this, this is very very important clinically. So um, you know right ventricular infarct, and these patients are usually treated different. Uh, you might have a cardiomyopathy that involves just the right ventricle, okay? Or the patient may have a generalized cardiomyopathy, which involves the right ventricle as well. Pulmonary hypertension, because remember, the, the, the right ventricle have to, uh, you know, have to contract and pump blood out of the RV into the pulmonary circuit. So you have pulmonary hypertension that's going to affect the, the, how well the, the right ventricle performs its duty. So it, it will get thickened, okay? It will get thickened over time, and it can fail, okay? So pulmonary hypertension over time can cause the right uh, ventricle to fail, and when the right ventricle start failing, then that's a, a downward spiral for the patient. Um, left to right shunt, uh, can affect the right ventricle because you're going to get increased blood flow into the right side of the heart. And as a result, you're going to get a volume overload situation. The right ventricle is going to dilate. And then arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. This is when the right ventricle is infiltrated. The muscle now is replaced by fibro fatty tissue. So the, the, the RV... The, 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 the muscle that usually forms the RV, the right ventricle, is now replaced by fiber fatty tissue. And this makes the, um, the, the right ventricle very arrhythmogenic. These patients are prone to ventricular tachycardia and death. 
um, okay so so again what are the echocardiographic findings that best differentiate the RV from the LV you have to know this this comes in all all exams and not only exam but you need to know this just in general because someone coming coming to the echo lab you have to know um, you know is this the right side or is this the left side you know you you get patients with transposition of the great vessels and other type of congenital abnormalities so Again, the more apical insertion of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve relative to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So that identified that you, you, you're dealing with the, um, the right ventricle. And the presence of the moderator band. So these are two very important features that help you to identify that you're dealing with the right ventricle. Of course, the presence of more than you know, two popular muscles, three, you know, the, because the tricuspid valve has three leaflets and you tend to have three popular muscles or more. Um, the the, the tri-leaflet configuration of the tricuspid uh, valve um, with septal popular uh, attachments. And you have to know the different leaflets of the tricuspid valve. But when we get to the tricuspid valve, we'll go over that in a little bit more uh, detail. And again, the presence of coarse trabeculation. The, remember that the right ventricle tend to have much more trabeculations than the uh, LV. So those are the, the features that make the right ventricle uh, more identifiable. So if you look uh, on the this cartoon, well, the, this is the actual this is the actual echo. Um, so to 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 the right, you have this is a apical four chamber view, and again, you know the heart is not going to come labeled like this, but you can see the tricuspid valve is more apically or it's lower in the ventricle than the mitral valve, okay? And then if you look, there's a moderator band right there, moder uh, moderator band. Uh, you can't see the trabeculations, but it tends to be, the RV tends to be much more trabeculated and you have multiple papillary muscles, okay? So when we, when we look at the, the right ventricle and even though this is an apical four chamber view, it is a modified apical four chamber view. Um, we, we, it, it is an RV focus view. So you adjust the apical four chamber view to, to identify uh, closely uh, the, the right ventricle. And there are a few measurements that uh, you need to uh, note, okay? We have a, a, a measurement, uh, the basal measurement, so we call RVD1. So this is your basal uh, measurement, and then you have a mid-cavitary, uh, our mid-cavity uh, measurements, and that's the RVD2. So you do the basal measurement there, okay? And then the mid okay in mid cavity mid cavity uh, measurement and then you have this longitudinal measurements uh the 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 um longitudinal dimension goes from it goes from the the tricuspid annular plane straight to the rv apex okay so again this is a rv focus view uh, so just a little bit different from your apical four chamber view in that you adjust it so you can see more of the, the RV and the measurements you're going to do, you're going to do your uh, basal measurement right there, okay, and your mid cavity, uh, mid cavity measurement and then the longitudinal dimension and you have to know the dimension, the upper limit of, of normal then. You have to know the upper limit of normal. So 
when you do your measurements, okay, again, we say it is a, a, a RV focus uh, view, the base measurement should be less than 4.2. Anything greater than 4.2, we say it's enlarged. And then at the mid level, anything greater than 3.5, we say that that it, it's, it's dilated, the RV is dilated, okay? And then the longitudinal dimension, anything greater than 8.6 indicates RV enlargement. So again, this is, so this is the basal measurement, 4.2, okay? We, we somewhat ignore the, the mid, but the basal measurement is very important. So anything greater than 4.2, and then your longitudinal measurement, so, so you have to pay attention how the longitudinal measurement is done from the track hospital and the plane. Okay, you drop a perpendicular straight up to the um, the apex. Anything greater than 8.6, all right, indicates enlargement. And then we also look at the RV, uh, right ventricular flow track uh, dimension, and you have to know how to measure it. So. You can do the proximal right ventricular flow track right from your uh, aorta uh, uh, septal junction, and you drop your perpendicular, and then you can do it also in the short axis at the level of the um, aorta. Uh, you just measure from your from the aorta from the aortic wall to the RV wall, okay, and then you can have the distal. So these are proximal measurements of the right ventricular flow track, proximal measurements, okay? So when you measure from the junction of the aorta and the septum to the RV wall, so proximal R R R RVOT, and again, in the short axis, from the aorta to the RV wall, and that's your proximal. The distal is, is just above the, the short axis view, just above the pulmonic valve, that's your, your distal right ventricular flow track measurement. And again, what you do, this is, this is a modified view looking closely at the right ventricular flow track. So a lot of your right ventricular uh, 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 measurements or uh, assessment are gonna be modified views somewhat. Okay, so again, so you have to know the upper limit of uh, these measurements because anything greater than the upper limit suggests enlargement. So for the proximal right ventricular flow uh, track, we use uh, 3.3, okay? Anything greater than 3.3 centimeters, okay? So this is the, the proximal right ventricular flow track. So you have to know how how you do the measurements. And then the distal right ventricular flow track just above the, the pulmonic valve and anything greater than 2.7. Okay, so for, 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 for um, the, the proximal, anything greater than 3.3 suggests enlargement. And then for the distal, anything greater than 2.7 uh, suggests uh, enlargement, okay? All right, so the RV wall thickness, it, 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 you know, it should be a part, it should be a routine part of um, all assessments. It's, um, okay, it should be a routine part of um, all, all, all assessments, okay, because, um, You, you don't know when you're gonna come across, um, just give me one second. You don't know when you're gonna come across. So this is how you do your RV wall uh, thickness measurement. So you can do your, your subcostal view. So when you do your subcostal view, you, you get this image of the heart where your, your, the, um, your RV is right there and your RA is right there and your liver is right over there and you can distinctly see the, 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 the RV wall 
So you want to measure the thickness. It's best to zoom it because once you zoom it, you 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 eliminate, you, you reduce your arrow, and you can and then you do your measurements. The upper limit of thickness is five mil millimeters. So the RV wall should be less than five millimeters in thickness. And again, zoom it so you can reduce the arrow. You can also use your M mode. And when we go over M mode, you'll see, you know, how this is done. And you again, you zoom it so you can um, measure the thickness. Okay. You, you tend to get RV uh, thickening in, in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Those are the cases that will give you more uh, RV, th uh, RV thickening, okay? And then the, the upper limit uh, is five millimeters. Anything greater than five millimeters suggests uh, uh, RV thickening, RVH, right ventricular hypertrophy. All right. So remember the thickness. It should be a routine part of um, your study, okay? All right, so, and then the, the, just, like, just like how you measure your LV uh, thickening, the, the measurement should be in diastole, okay? So your measurement should be in diastole when the muscle relaxes. And again, you, you, you can do it in your subcostal view or the left parasternal view. Always remember to zoom it. As a matter of fact, most of your measurements that you do in echo, you should zoom it so in order to reduce uh, your error. So thickness greater than five uh, millimeters, or 0.5 centimeters, indicates RVH. And you tend to get it mainly in pulmonary hypertension. You can get it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if, especially if the, if the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy involves um, you know, the, the right and the left side also in um, certain infiltrative diseases such as amyloidosis. All right, so just like the LV, the RV have a systolic function. It has a diastolic function. And if the systolic function is abnormal, then, you know, you, the patient will have some sort of... Uh, you know, symptoms and, 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 sign and, and signs in some respect. So things that will affect the RV systolic function is if you have a primary right-sided heart disease. So you can have a disease, some pathology that affect mainly the right side of the heart. And remember, we talk about the arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. That, that is a condition that Pre, well, mainly affects the, the right side. And with your arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, the RV wall is replaced by fiber fatty tissue. And that will affect the RV systolic function because since the muscle is replaced by fatty tissue, fatty tissue doesn't contract. So that's going to affect the RV systolic function. Also, the RV systolic function may be affected by something going on on the left side of the, the going on in the left side of the heart. You may have a left-sided cardiomyopathy. Okay, there may be a left-sided cardiomyopathy that is heart muscle disease uh, that that uh, involve the left side, and then because you're going to get increased filling pressures, increased left atrial pressure. The, the, the pulmonary pressures are going to increase, and then that's going to affect the RV and can affect the RV systolic function. Um, so we usually say that the most common cause for RV failure is LV failure. So that still holds through. Uh, and then valvular uh, heart disease. So if the patient have, uh, you know, tricuspid, significant tricuspid regurgitation, uh, pulmonic uh, insufficiency. These uh, valvular lesions can also, over time, affect the RV systolic function. So it's important for us to, 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 to measure RV systolic function. And we have a few methods 
to measure RV systolic function. Um, you know, when we measure LV systolic function, you know, you, you can do your ejection fraction. Um, you know, you can do uh, we, you, you can do Doppler assessment to evaluate uh, uh, systolic function. You can do tissue Doppler imaging. Uh, you can do strain, strain rate, and stuff like that. Those uh, assessments are still available to the to the right side, but we tend to use um, more commonly uh, uh, some different uh, uh, assessment or different tools. We're gonna go over RIMP, okay? So this this is one of this is one of uh, the, the, the quantitative uh, evaluation of the right ventricular uh, systolic function. Well, RIMP actually look at um, the overall performance, and we'll go over what RIMP is, but it stands for right ventricular index of myocardial performance, RIMP, um, and then. We're going to look at what we call 2D RV fractional area change. So this is just an area change. It's a 2D measurement, two-dimensional measurement, and we look at RV fractional area change. And we're going to go over that as well. And then tissue Doppler imaging of the tricuspid lateral annular systolic velocity. We're going to go over that. The name is long. It's very simple, but the name is a little bit um, long. And then the common TAPSI. Everybody has been doing TAPSI, TAPSI. TAPSI stands for tricuspid, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Basically, how, how much the tricuspid annular plane moves up in systole. It's just, it's just a linear measurement. How much, what distance it moves up. And we're going to go over that. We also can do 2D RV ejection fraction. This is a little bit more cumbersome. And um, most people will do 3D, three-dimensional RV ejection fraction, which is uh, a little bit more common. And of course, you, you, you have, again, strain and strain rate. Because these, um, depends on the technique that you're using, these are very, very accurate, strain and strain rate. So this is this is RIMP, and let me let me just try and break it down, okay? So first of all, you have to understand the definition for RIMP, and it is just looking at the myocardial performance, the performance of the right ventricle, how well the right ventricle is performing, okay? So remember when we when we look at systolic function and diastolic function, you know, with systolic function, we see how well the, 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 the heart is pumping, whether the right side or the, the, the left side, how well is it pumping, okay? The definition for RIMP is your tricuspid, uh, it is the definition, so, okay, so the definition is tricuspid valve Closure to tricuspid valve opening minus ejection um, time over uh, over the ejection time. So so let let's go over the definition because once you um understand the definition, then you can you can you can you know work it out. So RIMP, right ventricular index of myocardial performance. You just you just want to assess how well the, the muscle is performing. And the definition is tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening minus the ejection period divided by the ejection period. So so basically what you're seeing up here is the tricuspid inflow, tricuspid inflow. So of course, when you know the tricuspid valve opens, okay, you have your E velocity, your A velocity, then the tricuspid valve close, okay. 
the tricuspid valve close uh, just like on the left side just just like on the left side you have your IVCT IVCT remember IVCT isovolumic contraction time because the tricuspid valve is closed the pulmonic valve is still closed then the pulmonic valve opens when the pulmonic valve opens you have ejection across the, the right ventricle flow track okay then the pulmonic valve close then you have your IVCT sorry IVRT sorry IVRT isovolumic isovolumic contraction uh, relaxation time IVRT isovolumic relaxation time then the 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 tricuspid valve opens again and you have your ENA velocity okay the definition for rim is the period so these are time measurements okay the time from mitral valve sorry time from tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening then you're going to subtract from that the ejection time or ejection period and you're going to divide by the ejection time or the ejection period by just looking at this you can see that if you subtract from the tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening if you subtract your ejection time you're going to be left with your IVCT plus your IVRT and of course you're going to divide by your ejection time so this this formula becomes IVCT plus IVRT divided by ejection time okay because how well the, the the muscle is performing is 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 you know if the muscle is performing very well then you you know your your ejection time is 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 not going to be very prolonged okay because if the muscle is 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 very effective in pumping ejection time is not is is going to be shortened somewhat and it's also going to affect your IV CT and IV RT okay so the definition for rim tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening you're going to subtract from that the ejection time okay the blood is going to be ejected across the right ventricle flow track and this is the Doppler signal for that so you just so these are all Doppler signals so once you get your Doppler you can do your time uh, me time measurements and your uh, subtraction so RIMP right ventricular index of myocardial performance tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening minus ejection time divided by ejection time but if you you can just look at right there if you subtract ejection time from this time interval there you're going to be left with IVCT which is this and IVRT so in, in, in essence it's a, it is IVCT plus IVRT divided by dejection uh, uh, period. So that is RIMP. You can also do RIMP using tissue Doppler imaging. We're not going to do that tonight. But anyway, so when you simplify the formula, you get IVCT, isovolumic contraction time, plus IVRT isovolumic relaxation time divided by the ejection time with, with systolic dysfunction you tend to get prolong, prolongation of the IVCT and shorten of the uh, ejection time so the RIMP increases okay so 
we say, you know, if, if the RV, you would say that the RV systolic dysfunction is present if the RIMP is greater than 0.4. So you have RV systolic dysfunction if RIMP is greater than 0.4. Okay? And these are just, you know, IV, IVCT, isovolumic contraction time, IVRT, isovolumic relaxation time, ejection time or ejection period. Um, they, there's a tendency to use RIMP in 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 in, in research uh, centers because it, it, and especially in certain disease uh, process. Uh, you know, institution will use RIMP to assess RV uh, systolic function or uh, dysfunction. All right, so another method to assess RV systolic function is what we call the RV fractional area change. So it's just it's just a uh, area change, and we express it express it in a fraction. So it is your end diastolic area minus your end systolic area divided by your end diastolic area. So if you were doing ejection fraction, you'd use volume. But this is not an ejection fraction. It is your RV fractional area change. So you use your end diastolic area. You're going to subtract from that your end systolic area and divide it by your end diastolic area. And this is the fractional area change. So you have RV systolic dysfunction if your fractional area change is less than 35%. So what you do to get that in diastole, you trace or you do planimetry of your RV endocardial border it's from your apical four chamber view. And in systole, you do the same thing. And your computer will give you your area. So it is your end diastolic area minus your end systolic area divided by the end diastolic area. The number is 35. Anything less than 35 is abnormal. All right, so, and these are some, some um, examples. So in the first uh, case to, to the left, so these are RV focus views, RV focus views. So, so apical four chamber view, but you know there's more focus on the, the the right side. So you do planimetry of the RV endocardial border in diastole, and you do it in systole, and of course the formula is the end diastolic area minus the end systolic area divided by the end diastolic area, and this is 60%. So this is very normal. In this case, you do the same thing, endocardial border, end diastole, endocardial border, end systole, end diastolic area minus end systolic area divided by the end diastolic area, 40%. So it's a little bit above your 35%, but it's still still normal. It's lower, lower limit of uh, normal. And then in the third scenario, your end diastolic area, so your plane, do planimetry of the RV endocardial border, and in systole you do the same thing, and end diastolic area minus end systolic area divided by the end diastolic area, fractional area change 20%, definitely less than 35%. So this is abnormal, RV systolic dysfunction, okay? All right, so we have looked at the RIMP. We have looked at um, fractional area change. Um, we, let's look at um, TAPSI. So the TAPSI stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Okay, so TAPSI stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Basically, you want to see how far up the tricuspid annular plane moves in systole. How far up 
or the distance traveled by the tricuspid and the plane in systole. It is a, it's a very good measure of RV systolic function. It correlates very well with RV ejection fraction. So it's an M mode measurement. Okay, it is a M mode measurement, very accurate. Okay, so you measure the distance of the systolic excursion of the RV annular segment along its longitudinal plane, how far up it moves in systole. You're gonna use your apical four chamber view. You're gonna place your M mode cursor at the lateral tricuspid annulus. And this figure is now 1.7. So they have, it has been revised. So anything less than 1, 1. 1.7 suggests RV systolic dysfunction. Okay? Anything less than 1.7 suggests RV systolic dysfunction. So this is how it's done. So your apical four chamber view, the cursor is across the so your tricuspid annular plane is right there. It's the lateral tricuspid annular plane. You want to see how far up this lateral tricuspid annular plane moves up. It's going to move up in systole. It's a very accurate, it, it correlates very ac uh, accurately with RV systolic function. And you put your cursor and it's an M mode measurement. So you press your M mode button and you're gonna get something looking like this. You just wanna measure the vertical excursion. So your, your tricuspid uh, annular plane gonna move, up, gonna move up like this. You wanna measure the vertical excursion, okay? Tapsy, very good uh, measure of RV systolic function. Then, Another method is your RV, uh, your RV uh, using tissue Doppler. You can get your RV systolic uh, excursion, your RV systolic velocity. Okay, but because of you know we're talking about uh, tissue velocity, so you have to use your tissue Doppler imaging. To, to, to look at uh, the, 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 the tricuspid and the plane velocity. So when you do TAPSI, you, you measure the distance travel. So TAPSI is, is a measure of the longitudinal uh, distance traveled by the tricuspid and the plane. When you do your tissue Doppler derived S prime, tissue Doppler derived S prime, it's the velocity you're measuring. You want to measure the velocity of the tricuspid and the plane, and that also correlates fairly well with your RV systolic function. It's just the velocity that you're measuring, okay? Tissue Doppler derived S prime. So it's a tissue Doppler imaging, apical four chamber view. Uh, Uh, your your Doppler sample sample volume is placed at the lateral tricuspid annulus, okay, and S prime uh, velocity is the highest systolic velocity, so it's a velocity. Tapsy measures distance or displacement, and your S prime measure velocity. This has been revised a little bit as well. So anything less than, uh, I think is 9.5, okay? So there's not much difference. So, so anything less than 9.5 indicates RV systolic dysfunction. So, you know, a very low velocity suggests that the, the, R, the RV is, is not contracting very well. And this is how it's done. So if you look on the, the left panel, you have you have your apical four chamber view on top. Uh, the tr you, you identify your tricuspid annular plane, the lateral aspect. You put your cursor right there. Instead of pressing M mode, 
you're going to press TDI, Tissue Doppler Imaging. And with your TDI, you're going to get a systolic uh, velocity. Okay, your ECG is always there. And remember, everything is gated. So in systole, you get this wave. And then in diastole, you get two, you get an early and a late diastolic. Remember, this is your S prime. So your so apical four chamber right there, cursor is right there. In systole, the tricuspid annular plane moves up. It moves towards the transducer. That's why it's above the baseline. And then in diastole, it moves down. You have an early, you have an early and a late uh, diastolic component. But this S prime, this is your S prime, okay? Tissue Doppler derived S prime. It's a velocity. And you can just measure, you can see the measurement, okay? Less than 9.5 is abnormal. All right. So we're going to, so those are the, the, the more common methods. Um, we're going to, we're going to, we, we're going to, uh, wait uh, uh, for the next uh, session to do the, the right atrium. But um, the important uh, the important uh, assessment for RV systolic function, okay, so, and you have to, the RIMP is, 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 is mainly for exam purpose. Um, as a, again, it's used in research institutions. And in certain disease states, you have to know the definition for it and, you know, how to, 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 to measure it. So RIMP, right ventricular index of myocardial performance, okay? And then we talk about the fractional area change, okay? It's just an area change. It's not volume. If, if it was volume, then we're talking about ejection fraction. So the magic number there is less than 35% is abnormal. And um, then TAPSI. TAPSI is a longitudinal measure. It, it, it's a displacement. It is a displacement. The distance traveled, okay? It's a M mode measurement. And we use anything less than 1.7 is abnormal. Okay, and then your tissue Doppler derived S prime is a velocity. Okay, you use tissue Doppler imaging to, 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 to do this. It's a velocity. So if you have RV systolic uh, dysfunction, then the velocity is gonna be lower than what, what you would expect. So we're gonna stop here and then on Thursday we'll continue with the